Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. Today, we're continuing our a series of talks on the Treza class and algebraic cycles. And we're very happy to have Padma Srinivasan, who's going to be speaking on algorithms for certifying non-triviality of Treza cycles. So Padma, is that all right if we record this talk? Absolutely. Thank you, Rachel, for the introduction, and Rachel and Drew for the invitation to speak here. Uh, I'm very excited to share something that I've been thinking about for the last few years, which are, um, as the title says, algorithms for certifying non-triviality of Cherisa cycles. I know Ari gave a really beautiful introduction to algebraic cycles in general and the Cherisa cycle last week, but uh, I do not want to assume all of you were there. So I want to spend the first few minutes just uh, briefly recalling what the Cherisa cycle is and uh, yeah, what it is we're trying to find algorithms for, right? And this is going to be very leisurely historical kind of overview um, for like how we got to the Cherisa cycle, um, right? So let's, so the story begins. Um, the main player is going to be um, a nice, nice curve, a pointed curve. So um, uh, nice for me is a technical term. These are all the hypotheses you might want to impose on a curve. So smooth, projective, geometrically integral. Um, and the main invariant of a curve is its genus. Let's say it's genus G and it's pointed. Um, so let's say this P here um, is, is, is a rational point on this curve. So uh, X is a curve over some field K. For, for a little while, I'll be agnostic about what kind of field I'm working over. So this can be any field. And let's say we have a, a K point on this curve. Um, so what do you do if you have a curve together with a, with a point? You can use this point to embed the curve inside the Jacobian, right? So you get, uh, we love curves, simplest things like dimension one, uh, but there are some things that we like even more, namely groups. So we can embed our curve inside this nice group that's canonically built out of the curve, this uh, Jacobian. Um, so uh, you, uh, you small price to pay, it becomes G-dimensional instead of one-dimensional. Um, so this is a G-dimensional group variety, also defined over the same field. Um, and um, because this is, uh, this is something we'll be generalizing to higher dimensions a little later on, let me also recall how, how we built this uh, canonical group variety out of the curve, right? So uh, we really want to stick the points on our curve inside a group. Uh, so we build a group, group out of the points of the curve, right? So at this J, you look at, um, let me give myself some room. I'm looking at the paper here just a little bit. Uh, so you look at uh, zero cycles on the curve. So this is um, a free abelian group on uh, zero dimensional sub varieties of X. So that's just points on the curve. Um, but uh, you restrict yourself to um, the degrees, the subgroup of uh, degree zero divisors, right? So you have degree equals zero. So this, uh, and I'm going to be generalizing this to higher dimensions uh, later on. So like this is in more familiar terminology, this, these are just degree zero divisors. Uh, but if I want to be fancy about it, I can say it's the group of homologically trivial, sorry, it's laggy, group of, homologically trivial uh, zero cycles. Uh, so very concretely, say if you're over the complex numbers, just uh, temporarily, you look at all sums of points on the curve with some integer weights, points on x, but um, these are not all of them. You look at sums where uh, the weights sum to zero, right? So this is the degree zero condition. Um, 
or um, you could say this is the kernel. This is the kernel of the degree map. Degree or the cycle class map uh, from um, um, V0, V0x uh, to homology, which in this case is just Z. Okay, so we're sending uh, some NPP to just the sum of the weights. Uh, so that's a canonical group you build out of uh, points on the curve. Um, and we're trying to cut it down a little bit by imposing this degree zero condition. So we send a point on the curve to uh, the degree zero divisor, which is X minus P. But um, this group is still pretty large. So to make it more manageable, like Ari said last week, we're going to impose a certain equivalence relation on collections of points. So we're going to take this large group and we're going to uh, quotient it out by the subgroup of rationally trivial zero cycles. So there's a canonical subgroup um, uh, labeled V0 rat. Um, so this is um, the subgroup subgroup of zero of rationally trivial zero cycles, zero here being the dimension. Um, so for the graduate students in the audience, these are divisors of functions on the curve. Um, right? So you pick you pick your favorite function, uh, rational function on the curve. Um, so you can think of it as giving a map to P1. So it's a branch cover of the sphere, of the Riemann sphere. And you collect together information on where this function has zeros and poles, right? So you have zeros maybe at these points, some of them with multiplicity, and then you have a pole at these three points. So, um, so the divisor, divisor of this function from my picture is just things like 2p1 plus p2 minus p3 minus p4 minus p5, right? So, um, so we are saying we're looking at collections of points which can be deformed to e each other along along a map to p1, right? So you, so you, you imagine that uh, this collection of points, uh, three points is being deformed with this collection of three points. Um, so this uh, that's how we build the Jacobian. So I've, I've been, I'm being a little fast and loose about what field I'm working over. So um, you can build this for every every field extension of K from totally. And one of the miracles that happens is that uh, these groups, one for like each field extension of K, very nicely assemble into the points of an algebraic variety. Um, it's a miracle that the Jacobian is a variety that this functor um, is representable. And you get a nice g-dimensional group inside which you can stick your curve. Um, and uh, what we're really mapping x to is the class of this divisor, x minus p, right? Um, OK, uh, please uh, be patient. I haven't gone to the Cherisa cycle yet, but I promise it's coming. Uh, but just to motivate the kind of things that are questions I'll be studying later, let me briefly uh, recall the kind of questions that drove 19th century number theory, right? So just, just beginning with the construction of the Jacobian, right? Uh, so one of one of the motivating questions um, once once you know that there is such a thing called the Jacobian and it's a group, you want to know how large is this group, right? So how large is say the set of k points of this group. Um, of course, okay, let me box this because this is an important question, like important questions will be in boxes in my talk. The answer is going to be, of course, this depends on what field you're working over, right? So this very much depends on K. 
Um, and let me recall some answers like um, tools we have for understanding how large this group is because we will see analogs of this later. So over the complex numbers, we do understand um, what the complex points of this group are. Um, so how do we know this? We know this uh, using cycle class maps or like Abel Jacobi maps, right? So what we have, um, this is like the main theorem of Abel and Jacobi from, uh, from the early 1900s. So this, this says the complex points, there is a map from J of C to the torus, C to the G mod, uh, Z to the 2G. And more canonically, it's it's uh, this is this comes from the integration pairing on on this uh, uh, on um, on a Riemann surface. So uh, on on X. So you look at uh, you take you take your degree zero divisor X minus P on your Riemann surface. Uh, if you have two points, you can draw a path connecting the two. So this X minus P is the boundary of some um, of some path and you inter you can integrate differential forms along this path um, so um, and of course this depends on the choice of path and that's this lattice you more out by you have the period lattice and one of the miracles that happens is like, uh, or like well, one of the nice things that that happens for like points in the Jacobian is that this this uh, this happens to be an isomorphism, right? So over the complex numbers, this is a pretty large group, or at least a group we can write down. It's a, it's a torus z, a z to the g mod z to the two g. Over, so over a large field, this can be large. Um, but more into we are, we are number theorists here. We, of course, want to ask what happens over small fields, like the rational numbers or a number field. And um, and uh, this is the theorem of model and way, again, from the early 1900s that drove like a lot of mathematics and very interesting mathematics. It says that if you're over a small field, uh, the set of rational points of this, of this group is, is a small group. It's finitely generated. Right. Uh, maybe I mean, I was asked if like I welcome questions in the, in the middle. I very much welcome questions in the middle. And if you don't ask me questions, I will ask you questions. So I have a question for the audience now. Uh, could you tell me what was the main tool? What's what's one of the main tools that goes into showing uh, G of K is finitely generated? The model way theorem. What do we do? Heights. Uh, heights, yes, there are two pieces. Yes, heights are definitely one of the pieces. That's the, that's uh, one half of the model way theorem. Yeah, okay, they say there's descent. Yeah, there's, there's mapping. Uh, yeah, exactly. There's mapping the, the rational points on the Jacobian into, into a Selma group, right? So just like here, um, for the weak model way theorem, um, thank you, thank you for the inputs. I, I'm enjoying this. Uh, you map, there's a similar kind of boundary map, mapping the rational points in the Jacobian into a Selma group, which sits inside uh, a Galba cohomology group, each one of the absolute Galba group, um, valued in the Tate module. Okay. Great. So... And yeah, this is one half of uh, what goes in. And like uh, Rachel points out, there's also theory of heights and so on. Um, and great. So this is all just trying to understand points on the Jacobian, uh, which uh, again, to step back, came from trying to understand uh, zero cycles on the curve. Oh, oh man, my notability is acting up. Uh, it's like, ah, okay, good. So all this beautiful 19th century number theory was built out of trying to understand how large are zero cycles on a curve, right? And today's goal is to like go further in time and get, get, get to mathematics we're studying now, which is to study, to try and understand uh, sub higher dimensional sub-varieties inside larger varieties. So today's goal 
and the goal of this whole series, one of the main objects we'll be studying in this series are um, instead of zero dimensional subvarieties and curves, we're going to step up the dimension. We're going to study one dimensional subvarieties. Uh, inside a g-dimensional variety, namely the Jacobian. Okay, so the main player for today, the group we'll be working in, um, we're going to change this a few times, but all come from this one thing. We'll be looking at one-dimensional subvarieties on J. Um, so this is just like we have the free abelian group on points, we have the free abelian group on one-dimensional subvarieties. Of, of J, say defined over K. Okay. Now we're going to pay a little bit of attention to fields, uh, fields of definition, all right? And let me straight away give you an example of, of an element in here. Here's an example slash definition of a very natural uh, element inside this group. I claim that you already know a one-dimensional subvariety of the Jacobian. Um, I'm waiting for someone to suggest something. Do you know any one-dimensional subvarieties inside J? Was it the image of the curve itself? Yeah, it's the image of the curve itself. Thank you, Rachel. You're very patient. You've heard me give this talk multiple times now. But yeah, you have a copy of the curve, right? So um, the Cherisha cycle is built... Um, The key object for today, um, C X P, um, it's this canonical element in Z one of J. So you can basically look. The I set up this very nice map from X into J, um, sending X to X minus P. So you can look at the image of the curve inside the Jacobian. That's a one-dimensional subvariety inside J. But that's not the only one, you know. Right, there's a second sub variety, which is a second isomorphic copy of the curve. You are inside a group. Remember, the very nice feature of J is that it's a group, so you can multiply, you can hit every point in this curve by minus one, and you get a second copy of, of this curve, kind of like a mirror image, the image under minus one. And um, so that's what you get if you replace this embedding by IP minus, which is sending every point to P minus X. Right, and the Cherisha cycle is the difference of these two copies of the curve. Um, if you just want a sing song way of like remembering what the Cherisha cycle is, sing to yourself x minus x minus, but make sure you put the minus signs in the right place. It's it's the cycle, all right. And um, so this this is this this is this an I'm allowed to take these differences in this free abelian group. Right? I'm allowed to add and subtract one dimensional subvarieties. Um, so this is supposed to be the analog of divisors on the curve, but um, we had a nice sequence of subgroups inside the group of divisors. We had degree zero divisors, we had principal divisors, and so on. So we have analogs of those in higher dimensions as well. Uh, Ari set this up, but let me briefly recall. So we have a natural filtration on, on Z1 of J. Um, um, so you have, you have, um, you have Z1 of J itself, and then you have the analog of uh, degree zero divisors, which is uh, the homologically trivial. This is why I, I, I set up degree zero divisors as this very fancy thing. Um, I, I call them homologically trivial zero cycles because now we have homologically trivial one cycles. So this is supposed to be the kernel of an analogous cycle class map. Uh, the cycle class map now goes from Z1 of J to uh, H2G minus two. This is dimension one or four dimension G minus one inside J. So this goes, uh, this goes here. Um, so that's the homologically trivial cycle. So it's like degree zero divisors. And uh, at the very end, you also have uh, uh, algebraically trivial, uh, uh, sorry, rash, uh, 
rationally trivial divisors, the analogs of um, the analog of principal divisors. So these are generated. Uh, these are divide. Uh, these are cycles generated by divisors of functions. But now, functions not on all of J, but functions on two-dimensional uh, sub varieties inside the Jacobian. You pick a two-dimensional sub variety. Pick your favorite function to P one. And now, uh, if you look at fibers, if you pick zero and infinity, your fibers are going to be curves, and maybe you get some fat curves, so on. Right? So, um, so similarly, it's 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 generated by things like, like this. And um, in higher dimensions, you have room to squeeze in another subgroup between uh, homologically trivial cycles and rationally trivial cycles, and those are the so-called algebraically trivial cycles. So. Here's something potentially new. It's not clear straight away from the definition, but uh, it took a bit of work to show that uh, in higher dimensions, uh, you sometimes you do get a genuinely new subgroup in between these two. And um, and the main question, the new motivate, the 20th century question of grading what we had about questions about the Jacobian. I mean, if you wanted an exact analog for like how large is J of K, the exact analog would be how large is this quotient of homologically trivial cycles, um, mod algebraically trivial cycles. Um, and that, that's quite quite a difficult problem so this 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 quotient group uh, as Arik said this is like the chow group this there is much less known in higher dimensions um um compared to what we know about points on jacobians and like even for small fields like number fields like um even knowing that this group is uh, finitely generated is, is still very much conjectural uh, these are a part of what are called the valence and block conjectures um, and even over algebraically close fields, like uh, we we don't quite uh, we don't have a very. I mean, there are Abel Jacobi maps, so there are these these groups do map to Tori, but they can have like a huge kernel and stuff. Like so, uh, we, we got really really lucky studying like points on curves that like the Abel Jacobi map over the complex numbers was an isomorphism. We knew like points over a number. We had the model Wave theorem and so on and so forth. Uh, in higher dimensions, we know very little, right? So, um, so this question is going to be too, it's too difficult. I mean, it's there and it's still an ob interesting object of study, but I'm going to simplify my life. And instead of asking about this whole group, I'm going to ask about this particular element inside this group. I want to ask, um, is this Cherissa cycle, this canonical element in, uh, um, in uh, one cycle that I described, how deep in the filtration, so you had like all cycles, all one cycles inside which you have homologically trivial one cycles, inside which you have algebraically trivial one cycles and rationally trivial one cycles. So you have the sequence of subgroups. I want to know where in this in this sequence of subgroups is the Cherissa cycle. So how deep in this filtration uh, does the Cherissa cycle live? All right. And um that's my new motivating question. I'm not dealing with the really uh, the difficult question of how large the Chow group is, but let's just focus on the Cherissa cycle, right? Um, any questions about the question before I start giving you some answers? No? All right, so let's see some answers. So here's something we can actually say right away. And something that we get by being smart about this, by taking the difference of these two copies of the curve, what taking the difference does is it makes the cycle homologically trivial. Um, X minus X minus is in, is in Z1 home um, uh, of J. And, uh, and this is because my, like, I think Ari pointed out, uh, Multiplication, but once you map x and x minus into cohomology, uh, they become the same thing. Minus one acts trivially on h two d minus two. Right. So this the Cherissa cycle is homologically trivial. It is like a degree zero divisor. It it becomes zero in homology. 
uh, but apart from that, where where um, where is this particular cycle really depends a lot. Just like before, the answer depended on what field you're working over. Here, the answer depends on like uh, the curve. You very much depends on the curve you're working with, and also to some extent on the base point. So, for instance, if you take a hyperliptic curve and you take a y stress point. Um, then, um, then actually, the two what I drew as two different copies of the curve are actually the same embedded curve. Um, the embedding is slightly different, but like as uh, sub varieties, they are the same. X equals x minus in in z one of j. So the Cherissa cycle is zero for for a hyperliptic curve. Um, With, with the rational bias to this point. Um, all right. Um, okay, so these are the simplest curves you can actually write down equations for, like y squared equals f. Um, but beyond that, like there are very few um, families of curves you write, you have explicit equations for. So if you wanted to understand what's happening to the Teresa cycle, maybe you want to ask for the generic behavior instead of writing down some very special curve like a hyperliptic curve, you might ask what happens to the generic curve. Um, this is what Charissa did. So Charissa said that the generic curve um, of genus G, at least three, um, the Charissa cycle um, does not go any deeper. It's not in the subgroup Z1 out. So it stops at being homologically trivial. It does not go further in. And actually, no multiple of it um, is algebraically trivial either. So for every non-zero n. Right. So for the generic curve, uh, your Cherissa cycle is you, the way to say it's not in Z1 algebra is to say it's algebraically non-trivial. Right. And uh, the, this, this talk is about tools we have for understanding Cherissa cycles. So the main tool that went into Cherissa's work is um, he was since he was working with the generic curve, he's al he's uh, he's allowed to um, he's, he's allowed to deform the curve a bit. So he he, he uses uh, techniques from degeneration and and complex Hodge theory. Um, so the things like integration to understand what was happening. And uh, I also want to lead into some of the talks that are coming up. There is very exciting recent work by friends uh, collaborators. So there's um, ongoing work by Alex Betts and Wanda Lee, who's speaking next week. Uh, that um, and they have a periodic Hodge theoretic analog of Cherissa's results, and you can actually deduce some stronger uh, statements if. Um, about uh, what kind of curves have like no, non-vanishing Cherissa cycles. So um, for this periodic hot theoretic analog. So this is very recent, like ongoing work. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out. Um, so that's that's Cherissa's result from 1983. It was his PhD thesis, nice uh, short paper in the annals. Uh, but it was about the generic curve. It's not a curve that anyone's actually seen or you can write down. So you might want to go back and ask, what about curves you can write down where you have equations? Can you say anything at all about the Cherissa cycle? So, um, so the first result along these lines is due to Bruno Harris. Um, he studied many people's, uh, what would be many people's favorite curve, the Fermat curve, Fermat quartic. Here's, here's the equation, x to the fourth plus y to the fourth equals z to the fourth. It's nice plane curve, uh, uh, nice plane quartic curve. And what he showed, is the Cherissa cycle of the Fermat curve is not algebraically trivial. So it does not, it does not go uh, any deeper. It, it stops. Um, it does not go any deeper in the filtration. Um, so this is, um, so this is what Bruno Harris did. So first explicit example of a curve and his, and his main tool, um, this is why I want to talk about the Abel Jacobi map at the beginning. His his main tool was integration. Uh, there is an analog of the Abel Jacobi map where you write 
Earlier, we wrote a difference of points as the boundary of a curve, and we integrated along the bounding curve. You can do the same thing, right? X minus X minus, it's trivial in homology. It's bounded by a cycle one dimension higher, and you can integrate along that cycle. And uh, what is, in a sense, this is a very nice two-page paper for those of you who like explicit computations. I recommend this. It's a very fun two-page paper. And what he does is computes a certain period integral and shows that uh, it's not an integer. All right? Um, but you might ask, see, seeing Cherissa's result and like Bruno Harris's result, you might ask, what about multiples of the Cherissa cycle of the Fermat quartic? Can those become algebraically trivial? We, this shows that this uh, Cherissa cycle is non-zero um, in the quotient group, Z1 Hom or Z1 Alt, but uh, is it torsion, right? Um, so this, um, so this, so, so this is also something we know. So Bloch studied the same object, the Cherissa cycle uh, of the Fermat curve, Fermat quartic, and he used a different, um, he managed to show, he managed to upgrade this result, um, Bruno Harris's result, and he actually showed not only is the Cherissa cycle not algebraically trivial, no multiple of it is algebraically trivial either um, for every non-zero integer n. And his tool was instead of using the complex uh, Abel Jacobi map, which is kind of like uh, a boundary map, uh, he used the Eladic Abel Jacobi map. This is like the analog of mapping points on the Jacobian into the Selma group. So he mapped um, Z1 home J into this Galva cohomology group. This method is Eladic. Instead of earlier, we had H1 Galva group coefficients in the Tate module. Now we, we are working in higher dimensions. So we have the 2G minus 3th wedge power of the Tate module. Okay. Um, so that was his main tool. And this tool is going to reappear at the very end. Um, so this is the blocks tool is what we will be using for our main result as well. Um, and since then, there have been many results extending the methods of Bloch and Bruno Harris um, to other, I know Rachel's favorite curves, like other Fermat curves, uh, to other low degree Fermat curves, you can use their same techniques. You can also build like an algorithm that computes these period integrals for like some low degree Fermat curves, Fermat quotients, like this is, um, a bunch of people I should mention, like Yap Top. Um, yeah, Yap Top studied like genus three curves that embed in a triple product of an elliptic curve. That was his thesis, I think, 1989. Um, Kimura, Tadakoro, Utsubo, a whole bunch of people who proved results about uh, low degree Fermat curves um, and proved non triviality of the Cherisa cycle, analogous to what we know about the Fermat quartic. Any questions so far? That sounds good. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so these are all about like very specific curves, right? Like a handful of curves, if we still count them. Um, the first uh, result for which in many ways for uh, was the inspiration for the work I'm going to present at the end is this paper of Eskandari and Murthy. Um, from 2021, which is the first paper is to study Cherissa cycles for a whole infinite family of curves. So they studied Fermat curves again. Uh, there's one for every degree, like every integer, x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. But um, I'm going to assume, uh, I can call this cm, or I'm going to confuse myself my notation. Let's call me x sub m, um, such, such that uh, there's a prime bigger than seven dividing this m all right and what Eskandari and Murthy show is for this whole family of curves the Cherissa cycle is not rationally trivial um, is not oops is not rationally trivial 
And they actually show its infinite order, like no multiple of it is rationally trivial either. Um, for every non-zero n, right? And uh, their methods um, was quite different from what like uh, Bloch and Bruno Harris did. They used this that kind of dimension reduction argument. Um, I don't know if they will call this that, but this is how I like to think of this. Um, the, they, they were able to somehow leverage all of these curves you're studying right now come with a lot of symmetries, right? The Fermat curve, like it's Jacobian, is a product, a uh, nice product of um, CM, CM curves. So you can use these additional correspondences, additional symmetries, you can leverage them to understand these um, groups of cycles. And what you can do is you can place, as Ari nicely said in his talk, one nice thing about setting up char groups is that you can you, you can start playing all kinds of games with like intersections of cycles and so on and so forth. And what uh, Skandari and Murthy do is they take this one cycle on the Jacobian and play some games with intersections and use use it to produce a zero back to familiar land, the back of the, uh, the land of zero cycles and curves. Um, um, and uh, we have a name for this, like, I mean, this, this, I mean, this maps to points on the Jacobian, right? And actually the um, Teresa cycle maps to a rational point on the Jacobian. And uh, this is one of the tools uh, this is just geometry of the Fermat curve. But the second tool, you might see that I have some hypothesis here on like primes dividing this M and so on. And the the way this plays a role is uh, we know a lot about the arithmetic of Fermat curves. We know model way groups, back to model way groups of Fermat curves. Um, we know there is an arithmetic input to, to this. That we know something about the arithmetic of J. Namely, we know that the model way group is infinite. Uh, this is due to results of Gross and Rurlich. Um, and they're able to explicitly verify that the Teresa cycle maps to a point, rational point of infinite order on the Jacobian, right? Um, and so that so this this was the inspiration for the result I will um, um, my result with my collaborators that I present at the end. But let me also mention. Um, this is this is, uh, this is okay. This is getting to current times. This is 2021, but there have been lots of very exciting new results about Cherisa cycles just in the last few years. So just to connect with the other talks in the series. So last time uh, you heard about um, this ex very exciting result of Ari Schwidman and Je Jeff Laga on uh, Picard curves. So these are genus three curves. Um, which have a Z mod three symmetry. Um, and they also use a certain kind, kind of dimension reduction argument. They're able to take the Cherisa cycle and map it to a point on an elliptic curve, um, but it's um, it's using the theory of Chow motives. Um, all right. So um, that's, that's again, that's, this is from a few months ago. And even more exciting, this is like something in March. Uh, this paper came out in March. But uh, here's an even more recent, very exciting result from like two months ago now of uh, Matt Kerr, Wanda Lee, um, Song Ling Shu, Wei Zhang, uh, uh, not Wei Zhang, oops, sorry. There are all kinds of names of people who work on terrorist cycles. Um, this is Tong Ha Yang. Um, you might have your favorite types of curves with symmetries. For many people, it's the Fermat curves, but uh, another really interesting families of curves that possess a lot of sy symmetries are the modular curves. They come with uh, lots of correspondences, Hecker correspondences, and um, you're going to hear about this next week in Von Lin's talk um, um, about Cherisa cycles and modular curves and how most of them tend to have infinite order Cherisa cycle and uh, their idea is to also leverage these extra correspondences on the curve. So they also do a dimension reduction type argument uh, using these Hecke correspondences or like more generally special cycles if you want to generalize to other, um, other curves like modular curves. 
Um, so very exciting. This 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 field, this this particular topic has seen very exciting results just like in the last couple of months, right? Um, so these are all results. Um, I want to point out that all the examples I've shown you so far, they all use um, all the tools starting from, let me scroll up, sorry if I'm making you dizzy, uh, starting right up from like Bruno Harris. Um, he used the fact that we know periods of Fermat curves, like this is a very special curve with symmetries. Block again used the fact that like the Jacobian of the Fermat curve like decomposes into a product of three CM elliptic curves, which we know. And um, Iskandari Murthy also very crucially used the fact that this curve, these Fermat curves come with these symmetries, come with these automorphisms, and uh, also the results of like Lagar Schnittman and um, one, one of them collaborators. All of these tools so far really uh, can only be used, or not only, but like they'd heavily used um, uh, to curves which possess these additional symmetries. And somehow you leverage these symmetries to um, understand the Teresa cycle, right? So my main question right now is like, uh, what if I didn't pick, uh, I, uh, what if I didn't pick someone's favorite curve, like some, some very special kind of curve? What if I picked a curve at random, right? So here's my refined or more, more specific motivating question. What can you say about, about the Teresa cycle of a random curve? One with no symmetries whatsoever, you just wrote down an equation at random. Okay, okay, let me actually move this to a new page and put it in a box, make it, make, make it clear this, this is an important question. Um, what can you say about the Teresa cycle of a random curve? What would you guess, like, if you, if I had to, if I had you guess, if it, um, tell me if, if you think it's finite order or infinite order in the Chow group, what would you guess, given Cherisel's result, given what we know happens to the generic curve? Would you guess infinite order, finite order? I would guess infinite order. Yeah, infinite order, right? So the generic curve has infinite order Cherisel cycle. So you might guess that a random curve that you write down, you pull out of a hat, like has infinite order Cherisel cycle. But how do you actually verify something like this? How do you certify? All right, this is a very good guess to make, but today's question, uh, today's main result is about a way to actually produce certificates that Cherisa cycles have infinite order. So that's uh, the main theorem I want to present today. It's really an algorithm. Um, so this is, I must say it's joint work. Papers mostly written. Uh, hopefully, it will be out in not terribly long. Um, joint work with John Nellenberg, Adam Logan, and Akshay Venkatesh from this very nice uh, Park City Math Institute program a few years ago. I highly recommend this to any grad students in the audience. Um, three weeks of uh, very exciting mathematics. Um, so, what we do is we provide an algorithm. So, you input an equation, a nice curve, maybe with explicit equations if you want, um, over a number field. Um, and the output, either the algorithm will produce a certificate um, that the Teresa cycle of this curve has infinite order, uh, or it'll keep going. Hey, you have to tell it to cut off. It, Either it produces a certificate. When when it has like infinite order, it very quickly produces a certificate that the Cherisa cycle is infinite order or, or it keeps going. For example, you might wonder what I mean by this will not terminate. When you run run this algorithm, we actually ran it on a database of curves. So there are uh, 250, roughly 250,000 uh, uh, isomorphism classes of height one, smooth plane cortex over Q. This is just a very fancy way of saying 
uh, write down your favorite quartic equation. So, uh, so uh, some kind of linear combination of degree four monomials in x, y, and z, but you height one here refers to like picking small coefficients. So the coefficients in minus one, zero, one. So uh, these these curves that you write down, they fall into 200, roughly 250,000 isomorphism classes. And um, when we ran our code on all the curves in this database, um, uh, then, um, for example, we ran this in magma. The algorithm failed to terminate in in only hundred and two cases. I.e., in the remaining, so in in this two five four seven zero four curves, if you subtract hundred and two, you're left with. 254,602 uh, somatism classes, these remaining most of the curves have provably infinite order Cherisa cycle in the Chao group. So, uh, it is V1 home mod V1 rat. So, some remarks. Every time I state this result, of course, the obvious question is like, what about these 102 exceptions? What can you say about them? I'll say, I'll say some things, but not, not everything. Uh, what we did notice is that all 102 curves were somewhat special. They all had additional automorphisms. Most of them had a Klein 4 group acting on them. All of these have symmetries. And as a good sanity check for our code, it included some of the known torsion examples. Um, that we knew should show up um, in our code. Otherwise, our code, there's something horribly wrong with our code if it said a torsion example had infinite order, but uh, luckily it didn't. Um, and um, uh, so uh, some of them are torsion, and we understood like some of the 102 were like twists of the Fermat curve. So we knew we just had to run our code for longer. We stopped, we broke it off a little bit early. Um, um, maybe, and, um, and yeah, uh, so there are some, we don't know what's happening. It's not clear what's happening yet. Um, and the main tool, just like block, we use the Alade Kabul Jacobi map. Um, and the a limitation of the Alade Kabul Jacobi map for like a general curve is that it can only certify non-triviality in the Chow group. Uh, but uh, there, uh, if you if you're willing to work with more general Apple Jacobi maps, you have more powerful tools at your disposal. So I also have ongoing work. Uh, this might take longer. Uh, joint with Amnon Besser to use the periodic Apple Jacobi map. So if you if we can explicitly compute the periodic Apple Jacobi image, uh, this is a thing that you can compute. This is like mimicking Bruno Harris's compute computation of period integrals. But now um, you're using the, um, the periodic Abel Jacobi map. It's something you can compute using iterated periodic integrals, Kuhlman integration. Um, and you, the, uh, the powerful thing that you can do with Kuhlman integration is, is uh, you can certify non triviality in the Griffiths group. Um, I still have a lot of coding to do uh, for this project, but in theory, at least. Um, you can test if something is non-trivial in V1 home mod V1 out. All right. Um, so that's in terms of um, the main result. If I have like five more minutes, I can tell you a little bit about, um, uh, yeah, say a little bit very briefly about the algorithm, what it actually does. Is sure. that okay, Rachel? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, great. So here's some details. Here's the main mantra. All right. Um, anything to do with algebraic cycles. Um, cycles are hard. Sub varieties are hard, right? Algebraic geometry is hard. You try and convert this to uh, uh, something more tractable to a linear algebra problem, I believe possible. Um, so we map our cycles into a, a um, into more manageable groups. We ma map the complicated Chow group into a group more tractable group, like a Galva cohomology group. So you get, when you do that, you get the cycle class. So cycles are hard, but cycle classes 
are easier. That's that's the mantra you should chant to yourself, and you should ask if you're given a your favorite algebraic cycle. You can uh, you should try and understand its cycle class, right? Just like points on Jacobians are hard, but like Selma groups are nicer, right? Something we can work with in the same in the same spirit. So, the the main tool for understanding Cheris cycles is is the analog of the boundary map uh, of the Kumar. Uh, of the Kuma map that we use for understanding points on Jacobian. So here you have blocks refined a LADEC cycle class map. So this takes a homologically trivial cycle, one cycle, and maps it uh, into this Galba homology group. Like I told you before, it's H1, GK, H2, G minus 3. I should put in twists now as I'm being very careful. Um, and you can do this for all L. And the Cherisa cycle maps to this thing that we call uh, that we call the Cherisa class. It's image under the uh, under all these cycle class maps. And an easier thing to do, uh, you wanted to show that the Cherisa cycle has infinite order. You instead, uh, an easier goal is to try and certify that its image has infinite order. That would be a much stronger statement, right? So you certify. That the Cherisa class its image under this um, refined cycle class map has infinite order. Okay, so that's that's what you want to do. And uh, you have, you this this proceeds in two steps. Um, so you mapped your complicated object into a simple group, and you're trying to test if, if this element, this Cherisa class, it, is torsed in or infinite order. So the first step is to try and understand all torsion in this target group, or like try and bound how much torsion you can have. So step one, upper compute an upper bound. I'm gonna call it capital N on uh, the torsion in the image of the cycle class map. And the main idea here, this is just like what you do with like points and Jacobians. You chase, you play around with Kumar sequences and uh, this upper bound N, if if you ask me a question at the end, I promise to tell and give you a formula for what it is. It's something you can compute from the L polynomial of, of the curve. And um, this, uh, you get a non-zero integer N. It's non-zero by, um, by what we know about weights. Um, about the characteristic polynomial, right? So you first compute an upper bound on what what possible torsion this target group can have, but then you want you want you have the specific element, the cherish the class inside this group. You also want to know something. You you can't not everything's for free. You need to compute something about the cherish the cycle. Um, so that's what you do in the second step. You can produce a lower bound. You choose an auxiliary. good prime, prime of good reduction for the curve, and you can compute, use this prime to compute a lower bound, n sub p, uh, on the order of the Cherisa class. Okay, and the main idea behind this, I won't get into details, you can ask me a question and I can give you a formula for what this n sub p is at the end, but the main idea or observation, key observation is, Okay, you picked a random equation, a curve at random, and you're sad that it has no symmetries to play with. You couldn't do the old dimension argue, dimension reduction argument like Iskandari and Murthy or over the number field. But then you realize, you think about how you prove that uh, points on Jacobians have infinite order, right? If, um, what you, the key tool you have there is redu reducing the point mod P. You, you, um, you know, torsion in, injects into reduction mod P. That's what we do for like, points on Jacobians. So we're trying to try and play a similar game here. We try to get a low bound on, on the order of the, of the Cherisa cycle by looking at its reduction mod P. And the amazing thing that happens when you reduce mod P is even though initially you picked an equation at random, it had no symmetries. When you reduce mod P, you acquire symmetries. You have the, you have the Frobenius correspondence, right? And that's what you use. Curves acquire symmetries, acquire correspondences on reduction. Even if genetically there were none, you get you get new new correspondences on reduction, and and the main the algorithm plays off this upper bound 
plays off this lower bound with the upper bound. So you compute this upper bound on torsion order n, and you compute all these n sub p's uh, for all, all primes less than your favorite chosen bound. So for example, an initial code like with this 102, we, write, we chose all primes up to 100. If you find even a single prime where this n sub p, this lower bound does not divide the upper bound, then, um, then you output that the Cherisa class has infinite order. Right. If the Cherisa cycle is torsion, it should live in the torsion subgroup. The torsion subgroup has order dividing n, but you found by other means the Cherisa cycle does not have order dividing n. It has this order n sub p that does not divide n. Right. So, uh, so you play off the upper bound with this lower bound, and uh, and you're able to produce a certificate that the Cherisa cycle has infinite order. Um, I thought if I had time in the morning, I'll have a sneak slide where I have the formulas for n and sub p prepared. I didn't get to it, but if you ask me a question, I can tell you what it is. Um, I'll just say one last thing and end, end here. Uh, you might ask, if I, given the nature of this algorithm, you might ask, what if I didn't cut off the algorithm at some bound? What if I kept, like, if I just let it run forever, would it eventually produce a certificate that the Cherisa cycle has infinite order if it did? Um, so some kind of Chebotera, um statement. Uh, so we can't prove this um, in general for like all curves, but we can uh, we we can prove this for a generic enough curve. So if the Galva action on H one is maximal, uh, and the Cherisa class has infinite order, then our algorithm eventually, if you run it long enough, will produce a lower bound n sub p. Uh, that's big. The, these n sub p's are unbounded as p varies. Okay, so that's the companion theorem to our algorithm, a very natural question if the algorithm will eventually produce a certificate in the good cases. Uh, it can for the generic example. All right, so um, I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. If you're curious at the end, I, I can say a little bit more about n and n sub p, but I'll stop here.